okay to continue so basically as an mo i think this is the first surgery that i have done and um, it is like a c1 do one kind of thing but uh, in fact i have uh, very much less um, knowledge on it to begin as an mo but uh, as uh, it was usually taught by the uh, my senior but actually it would be much much more better if we are well equipped with our knowledge on the subject So oh, it runs a bit on the slides. Okay, now mind. So this is all the questions that uh, I gathered from my medical officers and also myself when I started on the surgery. So there's all these 10 questions. By all means, if you have more, you can add on if you want to or you can ask me later on. But um, just look through these 10 questions. If something that's relevant to you, um, that'd be great. I will try to explain as much as I can. So for some a little bit of background, so you know that, I mean, most of people know it actually derived from the word of a Greek word, a small wing. So basically it does look like a little flap over the eye. It's often bilateral. Bilateral means it's often like binasal and it's always it's situated at the palpable fissure area where we have uh, most UV light exposure. So working outdoor actually increases the risk by 1.5 folds. And also sometimes it also associated with dryness, inflammation, exposure to wind, dust, and other irritants. So you can see that why nasals has a bit more occurrence than the temporal because the UV ray actually reaches the nasal part of our eye about 20 times more than the temporal. So is it the degenerative or proliferative? But it is basically the elastotic degeneration. So why is it called elastotic? Because it has this worm-like uh, appearance of the fiber due to the fragmentation and the breakdown of the stromal collagen. So once the fibrovascular tissue start to advance into the cornea, it causes destruction of the Bowman's layer, which can cause the cornea scar. So this is one of the cases that's referred to me, um, but this is a recurrent pterygium, as you can see that it is huge. And this is a bit more complicated. It is a pterygium with symbiferon. So a simple classification of grade one to four, depending on the size of the pterygium and how it encroaches the cornea. So how do we recognize between pterygium and pseudopterygium? It's quite crucial because even though the, tre the treatment is about the same, but the technicality issue during the surgery itself is harder for pseudopterygium. So this is the list. As you can see that the most obvious is in pterygium, the neck is free. So basically, you can pass a probe through the neck easily without any difficulty. Meanwhile, because pseudoterygium has uh, issues of the limbals and because it's the inflammatory process, it actually adhered and fixed to the limbus and the probe cannot be passed. So when you want to do, when you want to consider telling the patient that they, she or he needed um, pterygium surgery, when there's excessive astigmatism, Pterygium is known to cause, commonly known to cause with the road astigmatism. And once it's encroaching the visual axis, it, cross, it, uh, it causes recurrent inflammation, chronic irritation, restriction of the move, eye movement, and even if the patient is complaining, uh, there's a cosmetic disfigurement. So our primary goal is to achieve a normal and topically smooth topographically smooth ocular surface. So you want to dissect a smooth plane towards the limbus using a blunt blade, like Took's knife that we commonly use here. And some people may use a sharper blade or even crescent knife. You preferably dissect down to the bare sclera at the limbus. So bare sclera means there is no thinon layers. You're just able to visualize the episcleral vessels, but the episcleral vessel should be intact uh, try not to uh, cause a lot of bleeders because it will be very difficult unless you are doing um, autologous but conjunctival glove closure. So the wound closure option. So bear in mind that the conjunctival autograph uh, closure it is the gold standard at this moment. And bare scleral closure is no longer a valid technique and is obsolete. 
but even so I will just go through the list of the different type of closures so that uh, for to for your knowledge so why are we leaving best Kara behind why is it in a bygone area because it's already reported to have the high recurrent rate almost like 90 so basically it's so high that you can even tell a patient is going to come back you know the moment you remove it so why bother removing it and leaving it a bare scara? so no you move on then you try to simple closure but still so simple closure is only effective if the pterygium is small but still the recurrence rate is quite high so people are thinking about how about rotational flap closure or conjunctival graft closure but of course, rotational flap closure, it still has a quite high uh, recurrence rate. But of course, it's slightly better than a simple closure. Still, the gold standard is our conjunctival graft closure by ultrograft. It has been shown the best result. Even some reported about 2%, but mainly about 5 to 10% is the standard. So a free graft corresponding to the wound is excised and then sutured in place. You can harvest it superior or inferior depending on the size that you need. Most people will harvest from superior because they needed a larger graft and it's easier. But inferior will have a bit of limitation in the sense that they have a lesser area for you to excise. So you have to harvest the graft slightly a bit larger than the defect because conjunctiva usually will contract. So once it contracts, it's actually very hard for you to suture and you can cause buttonhole and she's wired. So you might want to have a, a slightly larger graph. So you have to try to harvest a very thin layer of conjunctiva tissue that either there's no tenon or just minimal tenon for the success of the graph and for the best um, suture, uh, for, for it to adhere well and um, to adhere well to the, to the site. So it transferred to the recipient bit and secured to the site. So sometimes we do harvest, depending the situation, sometimes we do harvest along limbal stem cells together and we orient the graph and to place it adjacent to the site of the corneal lesion excise. So you cover the patient with antibiotic corticosteroids such as uh, Mesitrol, you can give uh, Trobadex, you can even give uh, a combination of antibiotic and steroids for at least four to six weeks. So you observe the patient and slowly taper down. As the inflammation subsides, then you can slowly off it. So it reduces the recurrence to two to five percent. So the complications intra-op. Uh, like I said, if this graph is too small, you might cause a conjunctiva buttonhole and let's say if we go excessive on debriding uh, the pterygium head near the cornea, and you're thinking that the cornea opacity itself is something that you can you try to remove it. Actually, those are the cornea scar. And the more you remove, actually, you go deeper and deeper, and somehow you remove the stroma as well. So if so, it will be so thin that lead to cornea perforation. So post-op, you want to watch out for suture abscess, Scarab access, random normal formation, and persistent epithelial defect, corneal ulcer, and also surgical induced necrotizing scleritis. So we talk about this gold standard technique that introduced by Kenyon et al. at 1985. Initially, suture were used to secure autograph in place. In the current moment, we are still using sutures because uh, not every place has fibrin glue. But of course, fibrin glue is known to reduce the surgical time, the post-op discomfort, and as well as the reco recovery period. So there's two components to the tissue adhesive, and it will actually mimic the natural fibrin cord formation. So it is a biological tissue adhesive. It's a blood-derived product as uh, it is uh, um, it's a donation of the blood and you screen through all the infective screening as it is it, it would be for any blood derived product and it's going to be processed so usually at the market now the fibrinogen is uh, derived from human meanwhile the apertinine thrombin it is from bovine so there is uh, commercially available there's two types one is t which is uh, produced by baxter baxter 
and really steel fibre, which is produced by India, both are human derived product. So it reproduces the large stage of the natural coagulation cascade. The human fibrinogen is going to be activated by the thrombin formed fibrin and it will start, uh, become a strong adhesive. So the fibrinogen is the thicker solution where you will put it over the recipient site. And the thrombin, which is a thinner uh, product, it is going to put over the cornea and you slide the conjunctiva over or you can even put it a, a little bit over on the top of the autograph and then you flip it over depending on your surgical technique. Yeah, this is the sliding method. So once you put it up in the place, you will leave it about one to three minutes for the whole uh, fibrin to form and it will fully adhere. So if you do not have sutures, you do not have fibrin glow, then you can even try to use autologous blood. Basically, autologous blood is natural. It has no extra costs or associated risks, but um, you need to uh, um, abrade a bit of the patient's episcleral vessels if there is uh, not much of bleeding. But usually they'll tend to have a bit of bleeding. So you can use the blood film over it and uh, uniform uniform over the scarab bit. And then you put the conjunct graph on top. However, you must make sure that the graph that you harvest is slightly larger because uh, you need to crimple together the edge of the graph and you have to leave it about seven minutes for it to fully uh, adhere. Try not to cauterize because you need the bleeder. So when the pterygium is way too big, and uh, you know that you do not need, do not have enough of autograph or do not need, uh, do not have a, enough area, then you probably want to think about using a, a amniotic membrane graph. So especially like let's say it is a double-headed pterygium, you want to cover the whole area with AMT. So the amniotic membrane graph is still a bit the less superior, a bit less, it's still inferior to the conjunctival autograph in the sense of the recurrence is about 10% compared to conjunctival autograph, which is about 2 to 5%. And the post op management for AMT closure is slightly different from the usual pterygium accession case. You're going to put, once you put the AMT on, you're going to put a BCL on top of the cornea and you need to change the BCL regularly. Do not remove the AMT, wait for it to resolve and fully epitalize. Usually it takes about four to six weeks for the AMT to fully resolve. So management of recurrent pterygium. So what do you do when your patient comes back with recurrent? So try not to jump on board and redo the surgery. Just wait. Wait for the inflammation to subside. At least give it six months. And instead of doing the normal technique, try to do dissect and recess. What I mean by dissect and recess means you dissect from the head and you recess it. Instead of cutting uh, around the, some people like to just, uh, in they just cut and dissect from the head and the body and remove it. But in the sense of recurrent pterygium, you want to salvage the conjunctiva as much as possible and avoid conjunctiva shortening and simplifying formation. So you can think about using running sutures or interrupted sutures, it doesn't matter. And if needed, the AMT graph is necessary. Sometimes you might want to consider using mitomycin if patient has come back with a recurrent and usually I'll try to do one more time, but if let's say um, the third time, basically I will use mitomycin C 0.02%. And in this uh, recurrent pterygium, most important is the control of the inflammation, not only after the surgery, but prior to surgery, you want to control the inflammation. So this is the procedure. If you are using uh, mitomycin C, when you want to consider mitomycin C, so in the sense that, like I said, recurrence, um, you might want to consider using it. 
So the common dose is 0.02% and you applied it for three minutes during the surgery. But of course, you have to inform the patient about there's a risk of sclerosis, perforation and infective sclerokeratitis. Um, but the, it shows good result and the rate of recurrence is usually less than 10%. So there is a few cases that you might think that's out of your hand that you might want to seek second opinion or refer to cornea team or even oculoplastic team in such sense like cases in kissing pterygium. It may require AMT closure uh, uh, if your center do not have AMT or uh, if it's complicated with simbifera. And if there is an underlying scar that, or thinning that you are worried about and you require cornea team, and if let's say the patient comes with pterygium, unfortunately they have a intermusin catara impending uh, fecomorphic or impending fecolytic. You might want to, depends on whether you want to proceed, because if you want to wait for the pterygium, then only proceed with for the cataract surgery, it might be a bit late. So in that sense, you might want to see whether you want to do both at the same time. So this is a surgery, this is a surgery video of my surgery of a recurrent pterygium. But how come it's a bit lagging? Okay. All right, this is a recurrent tetragem. So you can see that actually uh, it is very tight and it's causing restriction of the eye movement of the patient and there is a huge scar underneath. So um, the video is a bit laggy, I think. Sorry, can I just go back a little bit? Can I? Here you can see that I'm um, patient is under local, which actually um, it was a quite a long procedure, so I would prefer to be under GA. So basically, I balloon up the the cherry gem with an a local, and then I dissect and reset. Why do I mark it? Because I wanted to know the rough size of the cherry gem if I later if I want to trim it further. So that's why I use a marker to mark it. So I use the technique of dissect and recess. And you can see that there's a lot of fibrovascular tissue and it's all adhered toward down. So it's very, very difficult. And I have to use a crescent net to slowly remove the pterygium because of the severe fibrosis. You can see all these are the fibrosis, all the fibrosis tissue. Then I need to uh, slowly release it and uh, excise it away. So because I because it's also restricting the eye movement, that's why I'm um, locating the medial rectus muscle and ensure that I can clear the whole fibro fibrosis tissue away from the medial rectus as well. So once I've done that and I have size enough and I put an AMT on board and uh, start suturing with uh, Vicryl um, AO. So you can see that even I didn't remove a lot of the pterygium, the whole ter the whole conjunctiva has uh, contracted and recessed back because uh, the caruncle itself actually was tracted up. So even though I do not cut a lot, you can see that it leaves a huge area that I need to cover with AMT. Despite from the initial period when you see, it's just a, maybe a, like a normal small pterygium. But in fact, once I cut it and the conch tissue has uh, retracted back, it has uh, showed that the huge area that I need to cover with AMT. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Thank you. So back to the 10 questions that uh, I have in mind or you guys might have in mind. So I hope that I've answered most of the questions. Uh, maybe I have an answer number six, which nylon or Vicro sutures. So basically you can use both. There is no right or wrong. But if let's say if you're using nylon one, it is harder to bury it and it costs a lot of discomfort. It is wired. And if let's say you will keen to use nylon, then you have to take a bit of the episcara as well so that it's, you can able to bury it. So what I do, I use Vicro uh, 780. And let's say if you feel that the, it gives a bit of inflammation post-operatively, once it epitalizes, you actually can safely remove by a week or so, depending on whether it has already adhered and fully epitalized. If so, you can even remove the vicro suture earlier. It's fine. So the, self, the question MT I have answered. So basically, I have been called before whether you can do the cataract surgery or pterygium surgery at the same setting. If, of course, you would prefer to able to remove the pterygium first before the cataract surgery because you want to get a proper care. But let's say if the patient has some issue with the cataract, like fecomorphe, fecolite that needs immediate attention, by all means, do that and later the pterygium or even at the same setting, if it's possible, you can even do it at the same setting. So for how long you want to continue the topical medication, as I mentioned, about four to six weeks, let's say if still you feel that there's a lot of inflammation, you can even stretch it out a bit, but watch out for steroid complications. So this is my references. And thank you so much. Any questions? Too late. Okay, you want to present the other video? No. Oh, that one is another. The other one is another. Video. Another video. Mm. That one is for the corner scan. Oh, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I own, I own the okay, thank you very much, Dr. Lai Yin Peng. So now we still have some time before lunch break for QA sessions. So if you have any questions, you can type in um, the type the questions inside the Slido link that we have provided. Any questions from the participants? Sure, sure. No worries. Don't need. Yeah. Basically, you soak it with the sponge wig just as you do with a tri bag. So you just soak it, but you do not need it to be very wet. Uh, you just soak it with a sponge wig and you put it on top. About three minutes. Yes. Yes. Then you rinse it with copious amount of uh, BSS. Yeah. Oh, 
Yeah, this is uh, this is uh, from Dr. Fazura. Ask your question first. Maybe we can try. We can see this one first. Jobs or under So we have questions for Dr. Fazura as well. <clears throat> okay. Uh, for the first question, okay, why damage to orbital septa should not be sutured? Okay, if let's say um, we suture the orbital septum, okay, it can cause uh, com uh, the eyelid excursion can be compromised, okay, and then also can lead to lack of thalamus. That's why we don't suture the orbital septum. <clears throat> what if there is orbital fat present with with the eyelid margin with the eyelid margin there? How would we proceed at that time? Okay, if you can see the orbital fat prolapse, okay, from the <clears throat> eyelid eyelid uh, laceration. So uh, we give you clue actually uh, the orbital septum involved already. And then behind the orbital septum, there's this levator muscle. So we don't know whether this levator muscle also involved or not. Okay, if let's say this patient had uh, tosis, okay, it could be due to mechanical tosis if uh, there's a lot of periobital hematoma. Or if not much hematoma, you can see this uh, patient cannot divert the upper ID. So this is suggest of uh, involvement of the levator muscle. Okay, so if let's say you can see the orbital fat, you, we must rule out the blood rupture, that's the most important thing. And then this patient might need to do under uh, to do a CT scan, CT orbit to look for any um, corner scleral laceration. Especially the scleral laceration quite posterior, we cannot uh, visualize okay uh, from anteriorly. <coughs> in canalicular repair, <coughs> any other technique in case pigtail and mini monocles stand not available. Okay, actually, um, the pigtail, pigtail is not the stand, okay? Pigtail is the instrument like a Bowman uh, a stand, a Bowman um, pantom dilator. Okay, the first one, actually, the pantom, we need to dilate with the pantom dilator. And then uh, we put the pigtail or we can use the Bowman, okay? Bowman to cannulate the uh, canaliculi. Okay, and then the mini monoka actually the stand, the temporary stand that we use to repair the uh, canaliculi cut. Or we can use the Crawford uh, by canaliculi stand. Okay, if let's say uh, there's no mini monoka, there's no um, what we call the, by, uh, the Crawford by canaliculi stand, we can use the proline. Uh, zero, zero or one zero, okay, one o to uh, secure the canaliculi. <coughs> when do, uh, this one, yours, this one, is it? Job. 
for this one I pass to Dr. Lai. Okay, she's not answering. <laughs> okay. So actually it's a gen preference on uh, based on um, your comfort on doing whether you want to use autologous bath or suture. It's totally up to you. Um, you just want to make sure that it is successful and it's well here. So let's say even if you after you do the autologous and you waited seven minutes, you waited and waited, but the graph is still moving about. Put on sutures. There's no harm. There's no hard and fast row in that. How immediate and frequency of topical steroid? You can start two hourly. You can start initially two hourly, then slowly taper down. Depends. Let's say if the cherry germ is atrophic and the patient is already like an old patient, the cherry germ is atrophic and that is not affecting the care reading uh, when you, you need the care for your uh, S scan and to calculate your intraocular lens. So let's say if the care reading is acceptable, you do not need to remove the cherry germ. Um, you can just leave it be because you know that terrigium does not progress very fast. So there is certain cases that you might just think of leaving it and proceed with cataract surgery. But unfortunately, if let's say the terrigium is huge and is going to obstruct your view during the surgery, you might want to consider removing that first and wait for at least three months because you need to wait for your cornea to remodel, to get a proper care, and you need to make sure that patient's eye is no longer dry because once the pterygium is removed, sometimes the surface is irregular. So you can't even get a proper care. So about three months and above before you decided whether you can get a stable care for your proceed with the cataract surgery for the most optimum outcome of your cataract surgery. So what do we do? Let's say if there's a remnant uh, cherry germ on the cornea and it is tightly adhered, there is one thing that you need to make sure. You need to make sure that it is not the stromal that you are pulling and tugging and it, it's real actual cherry germ. Because if let's say it is, um, it is a real cherry germ, it's not a pseudo cherry germ, it is not going to be that adherent to the cornea. Usually it can be removed easily. But if it's really a hit very strongly to it, then you must think, is it the patient is a recurrent or is it a pseudo gem? And when you are removing, do not go deep. If you want to use a blade, fine. You can use a crescent to assist, but make sure that you're not cutting into the stromal. Okay, how long? The steroids, uh, top, oh, okay, I already answered the topic of medication, so okay. okay. So I've already answered the medication. You stretch about four to six weeks at least. Um, do you prefer upper or lower conjunctiva as the graph? Basically, I will see whether the patient, um, you have to look at the patient as a whole. Let's say if the patient presented with a glaucoma suspect, you might not want to take the upper conjunctiva. In view, the patient may have needed a a trabeculectomy later on, or even GDD, you do not want to damage those part of the conjunctiva, then I will take a lower conjunctiva. But if there's nothing to, uh, if there's no indication that I cannot take the upper conjunctiva, I would prefer because you can harvest a larger area and larger graph. Let's say if the patient has both, okay, if it's a both headed pterygium, yes, you can exercise both at the same time, but do not leave it bare scara. Try, if you can cover with autograph, that is great. But if you can't, then you have to consider using an amniotic membrane. Sometimes you bury the knot. Sorry? Sometimes you bury the knot in, out, out in the graph. So um, I think you're trying to say that you are doing the buried type of knot. Um, when your graph edge flips opposite, that means I you have to... What do you mean graph edge flips opposite? What do you mean by graph edge flip opposite? Actually, I'm not very sure of the question, but I can try to answer in the sense that always try to... Huh? I can't flip my charms to go. 
Okay. Do you guys understand the question? Okay. <laughs> I find that uh, a lot of people would like to take the first bite at the graph and this actually will actually when you take the first bite on the graph you actually the cause the graph to move a lot and it's not stable so always take the first bite where the where the recipient conch is so there's less movement and I find that technique that my graph would never not really move so even I put all the sutures my graph still properly on the spot and I don't really have any tugging issue with my graph because I always take my first bite on the recipient conch where it doesn't move. I'm using the same graph. You can use the same graph, uh, but provided it's uh, adequate enough. If during, okay. how to prevent the from. Basically, I think the 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 blood the autologous blood technique is a waiting game. So you have to see where the seven minute works or even eight minutes works. But if it's too long, we'll put the sutures. Sorry, I missed the part of can <laughs> you okay? Uh, that answer this one first, okay? Uh, if uh, da da da. So like I said, if a nasal and temporal pterygium, because you do need a huge graph, so most of the time I would prefer to use the AMT instead. Then I will cover the cornea as well where the epithelial defect is. Uh, mm, yeah. Oh, any question. In some cases, the post hoc care is still high after pterygium. Yes, you can if you, after the post, uh, if you waited a while and the cornea surface already remodeled and it's not dry, there's no PEs and you can get a great care and based on the care is still high, you can put in a toric lens. Uh, how long should we follow up? Um, well, you follow up the patient until it's fully epitalized and you are happy, uh, I think by few months down the road, if there's no recurrence, then uh, you can discharge the patient. Uh, how long? Basically, about four to six weeks, the patient will be on steroids, but uh, you will stretch it a bit longer if the patient is not compliant, if there is sign of information. If during the next TCA. Well, if let's say during the next TCA, the graph already dislodged. If the graph is still hanging by the sutures and it is hanging but uh, some part is loose, maybe you can consider of uh, putting back the sutures. But let's say the graph is already disappeared and there's nothing there. Uh, unfortunately, you just have to wait and see and tell the patient that and there might be a chance of recurrence but it still provides the patient uh, topical antibiotics and steroid to reduce the inflammation. And just follow up the patient, make sure it's epithelized and watch out for recurrence. Okay. Your pick there. Okay. <clears throat> okay, for the canalicular repair, actually I explained earlier, Okay, actually the pigtail is not the same as mini monoka. Okay, uh, as you know that the first step in canalicular repair, we need to um, dilate the pantum, reduce the pantum dilator. After that, we intubate the canaliculi. Okay, because in canaliculi injury, uh, the most difficult part is to find out the proximal end of the canaliculi uh, injury. So we need to use the pigtail, okay, to try to intubate from the, uh, from, for, for example, in patient with a lower canaliculi uh, injury, so we intubate from the superior and then comes to the proximal end and then find out the distal part of the uh, injured one. Uh, if we don't have the pigtail, we can use Bowman. Actually, commonly we use Bowman. Pigtail rarely used now. <clears throat> and then while we uh, got ready, actually, we can find already the proximal end and also the, we can oppose already the proximal end and also the distal end. We can use mini monoka 
or we can use Crawford by Nucleus 10, okay? To oppose all this together and then keep it to three to six months actually, for three to six months before we remove it. If let's say we don't have the mini monoca or uh, we don't have the Crawford by, by Canaruculus 10, we can use Prolin 00 or Prolin 10, okay? Uh, to intubate the thing. All right. Okay, back to me again. So let's say the patient has a dense scar that involves the visual axis. Yes, you can think about doing a dark uh, corneal transplant. Yes, that's the option if let's say it's covering the visual axis. But if it's not, then you try to see how much the patient can Im uh, improve the vision with uh, glasses or if let's say there's cataract, uh, you might want to just refer for a second opinion before proceed with the surgery. 